Morning, everyone. So good to see you here today. You guys appreciate the brightness in our sanctuary. I know it may be blinding a little bit of you. Uh, we just decided to brighten up the space a little bit, and it's a new year. It's a new day. And before I get into God's word, let me just give a shout out to God and God's faithfulness and to you and your generosity. We were able to have everything that we need come in to meet our budget in 2023. And and, um, you know, as I told staff and some of the leaders, my anxiety and worry and stress had absolutely nothing to do with that generosity and, and provision. But I do appreciate that. We're in a good position as we, as we begin the year. And as uh, Pastor Dustin told you, we got exciting things happening on the horizon. The Sunday night encounter, deep dive into Mark. I hope some of you will join us for that. We're going to have dinner and child care available for that. That's going to be a wonderful time to get together and really just get into God's word. And also love first revival. We also have in April, we're going to do Loving Our Neighbors, which is our outreach. We're going to get, on, get together on a Saturday, go out in small groups. We did, we did that years ago with Central with Beyond Our Walls. We're calling it Loving Our Neighbors, so you'll be hearing more about that. So exciting things happening as we enter the new year. And as we do enter the new year, we're starting a series today, Resolutions. And of course, as Dustin said, this is the season for resolution. This is the season that we come off of evaluation, right? And as we get to Thanksgiving time and into Christmas time, into the new year, uh, it's a season of evaluation. And then as we, as we turn the corner to a new year, it's a season of fresh commitment, of resolution, things that need to change, right? Gym membership goes up. <laughs> right? Dieting starts. Uh, all those things happen. And so from a spiritual perspective, I believe it's a fresh time for us to make good and clear, renewed commitments to our spiritual life. And the anchor verse for our series is Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, where the apostle says, since you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. This is a response to God's grace, and the apostle calls us to have a mindset. That's a commitment of thinking. That's a commitment of intentionality, that God wants us to commit to some things uh, so that we can grow spiritually. Um, what are we seeking in life is a good question. You know, what is our pursuit? Over the next several weeks, we will look at five particular words that should set the trajectory for a life that is being transformed by God. And the inspiration for this actually came from the Next Gen staff as we got together. We went to a, uh, we went to a conference uh, a couple months ago. We've met regularly and consistently, and we've come up with what we believe are five words that we want to shape our kids. We used one of our little ones who has recently been born, and we said, what do we want him to know, experience, look like, live into by the time he goes off to college or even if he stays around here, goes off into his career pursuit. And we said we want him or her, the little ones, to know Jesus and learn to talk with Jesus and walk with Jesus and serve with Jesus and to invite others to know Jesus. So know, talk, walk, serve, invite. That's the context for our series, those words. Um, and so we're going to hear from God's word to challenge us to talk with the Father more, to walk in the Spirit better, to serve in our giftings more, and to invite others to God's table. But this morning, we begin with the most important part, the priority for living, which more than anything else is to know Jesus better. With that in mind, I invite you to stand for the reading of God's word, which comes to us from the letter to the Philippians. Hear these words of God for us today. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, which comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize 
or which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we say together, thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Holy God, we give you thanks for this holy day and for this holy space set apart for us. We thank you for the words that you have put upon our lips to sing, to declare, and to pray. And now as we come to this time in your holy word, we pray that your Holy Spirit would so work in our hearts that from our time together, we might become more and more your holy people. In Christ's name, amen. In the 2009 movie, Up in the Air, there's the exploration of the price of relationships and the cost of living without them. It's about a man who flies all over the world, and his job is to fire people from their jobs. And he meets a woman who, in the relationship, changes his perspectives on things. And in one memorable scene in the movie, a young man is having second thoughts about getting married. The wedding ceremony is about to begin, but he is a serious case of cold feet. He's not sure he can go through with the wedding. A member of the family, played by George Clooney, is sent to talk to him. The young man says, I don't think I'll be able to do this. Clooney's character says, why would you say that? The frightened young man says, well, last night I was kind of like laying in bed and I couldn't sleep. So I started thinking about the wedding and the ceremony and about our buying a house and moving in together and having a kid and then having another kid and then about Christmas and Thanksgiving and spring break and going to football games and then all of a sudden they're graduated and getting jobs and getting married and you know I'm a grandparent and then I'm retired and I'm losing my hair and I'm getting fat and the next thing I know I'm dead. And it's like I can't stop from thinking, what's the point? (laughs) I mean, what is the point? (laughs) Now, that's a guy who got too far ahead of life, right? (laughs) Um, But I I wonder how many of us are like that, rushing ahead, anticipating so many things in advance that we're not able to not only enjoy the moment, but to meet the moment with the commitments that we need to shape our future. We anticipate a future that we're out of control in, and to many degrees, we are out of control of a lot of things, But somehow or other, our culture breeds this fear of commitment. And the fear of commitment keeps us from giving attention to the things that we should. I think we overanalyze things, at least that's my tendency. And our text this morning seeks to prioritize life for us a little bit. The apostle is giving a little bit of his own inner workings and what he's committing to and challenging us to live into that. Listen again to what he says in verse 10 of our text. He says, I want to know Christ. That's what he says. Turn to somebody and say, I want to know Christ. That's the verbal commitment of a follower of Jesus. I want to know Christ. Now, Paul already had a relationship with Jesus. I mean, I guess you could make the statement that he already had met Jesus. You could even make the statement that he already knew Jesus in some degree. He famously met Jesus on the road to Damascus where he was knocked off his high horse Remember that story from Acts chapter 9 that he tells over and over again? He met Christ. But now here he is years later, and he's writing from prison. Uh, So he is feeling the consequences of commitment to Christ. And yet he makes this bold statement, I want to know Christ. That's what he says. And what does he mean by that? You know, there's there's two types of knowing that we have. There's information and there's revelation. These are the two types of knowing that there are out there. Information is the processing of things, mental processing. We read something, we hear something, we see something, we assimilate it. That's what education in many ways is all about, the assimilation of a bunch of information, facts, putting things together, synchronizing them to come to some conclusions about life. We have a worldview that's shaped a lot of times by what we consider to be information. Uh, Sometimes right, sometimes wrong. Sometimes we get wrong facts, sometimes we reach wrong conclusions. Sometimes we get incomplete facts. We always have incomplete facts when it gets right down to it. Revelation is something totally different. It's an experiential knowledge. It's personal knowledge, uh, knowledge that comes from close uh, relationships. Spouses know their mate like no one else knows them. Parents know their children like no one else knows them. Uh, Friends know each other through shared experiences. So there's the knowing of information. There's the knowing that comes through the revelation of relationships. And true knowledge of others is more self-disclosed by that person. 
So in other words, that's really what uh, intimacy is. That's what love is. It's the self-disclosure of something to the other. It's the trust, the knowledge of it. And, uh, and this kind of knowledge can be communicated to, to a degree. How many of us have read a book and the author was so effective in bringing forth the characters that you felt like you knew them? Or that you watched a, a TV series or a movie and the acting was so good and the storyline was so compelling that you almost forget that they're not real people, <laughs> right? You kind of feel for them. You, you kind of emote about them. You, you grieve with them. And yet it's all an act. <laughs> and yet it's inviting you into this kind of relationship. Um, it is woven into the human experience to long to be known and to know. That's just what it is. So when Paul says, I want to know Christ, he isn't searching for more facts about God. That's not what he's looking for. He's longing to experience God as much as he can experience the truth of God in his life. Um, You know, to know someone in this way is to feel what they feel, to be in the inner chambers of their thoughts, uh, of their mind. We can only know God to the degree that God makes himself known to us. The truth is, is that the, the knowledge of God is unsearchable. We can't figure God out. I think there's a lot of people maybe who think they have figured God out. We've reduced God to a set of principles, to a bunch of factual information. Now, hey, I read the Bible. I know that stuff. Uh, that's not at all what the Bible teaches uh, about knowing God. God longs to reveal himself. Consider with me the apostle uh, John in his famous gospel. He says, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the father has made him known. That was the great revelation that John gave. Jesus came to make the father known to us, to reveal Uh, John introduces Jesus as God in the flesh, and that's just what we have celebrated in the Advent season, in Christmas time, the anticipation, and now the revelation of Jesus as God in flesh. He came to be a a one of us. He came to live our life, to share our experience. In fact, listen to what Jesus says in a conversation that he had with one of his disciples, Philip. He answers uh, uh, Philip. He says, don't you know me, (laughs) Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I'm in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. There's Jesus talking to Philip saying, hey, you've been around me for a long time. Still don't know me. Still don't know me the way I want you to know me. So it's a check on us to say, no matter how long we've been around church, no, no matter how much factual information we have about God, no matter how much we know the Bible, that there is a sense in which we don't know as much as we think we know, and that there's so much more to know. In fact, listen to what Paul says in his letter to the Ephesians. He says, I keep asking the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, the, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him. Notice the interplay of the Trinity. I keep asking Uh, through Jesus, that the Father would uh, help you know him by the Spirit. Uh, God invites us to know him better. While it is only by God's revelation that we get to know God, Paul gives us some clues in our text today as to how we can best position ourselves to receive God's revelation that he longs to give. And the first thing that we see is that we've got to make it our highest priority. Listen to what he says in verse 7 and 8. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Paul talks about the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. Christ Jesus. It's more important, he says. It has more value than anything else that I know or have known or could know. Paul considered the intimate knowledge of God as the most important pursuit of his life. And he was very cognizant of the competitions in his life against that. Consider what he just said in our, in our text prior 
uh, to that in verse 4 of Philippians, where he says, If anyone else thinks I have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, uh, uh, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness, based on law, faultless. Notice that. He, he talks about the confidence that he has is not in his flesh, which is to say not in his ethnic heritage, uh, not in his religious knowledge, not in his passion, not in his moral uh, uh, values or life. He considered these perceived assets as almost liabilities to really knowing God, that he might rely upon them more thinking that he knew God. And the reality was is that he, he didn't. Paul knew religion. He knew religion. He knew it backwards and forwards and inside and out. But he wanted to know Jesus. And therein is the challenge that we have as church people, that we know religion. We know systems. We know, uh, we know symbols. We, we know uh, history. We know and have experienced so much in regards to tradition. But do we know Jesus? Because for Paul, there's a distinction. And he said, I don't consider all these other things that people might look at and say, well, you, you must know God because you were, you were a Pharisee. Or, or you must be in a close relationship with God because you have a lot of devotion. You do a lot of service. And he's like, That's, you're missing the point. And this is exactly where we need to kind of meditate on a little bit today as we begin a new year. Is our desire to know Jesus more than any other thing? Uh, consider with me in his famous sermon, Jesus gives a warning. In Matthew 7, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Jesus challenges us about the basis of our religious devotion. He's talking about people who could talk about God. <laughs> Talking about people who could, who could give you answers about God, who, who might have even done some good works, who might have even served in a lot of capacities. And Jesus like, I never knew you. And you know what, I'm, what does that mean? Well, God knows everyone. But the true knowledge is always self-disclosed. Always. When Jesus says, I never knew you, it's meant you never disclosed yourself to me. You never opened yourself to me and were vulnerable about the questions that you had, about the concerns that you had, about the fears or the worries or the questions that, 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 that dog you. You were never honest about your doubts. You were never uh, confessing any of your sin. You never did any of that. You just simply talked about God and did some service. I never knew you. That's a challenge for us as we come together on this first Sunday of the year. The honest truth is that people can be around the church and talk about God and do some good things but not be in close relationship with Christ. People often use God as a means to an end, which is what our culture does a lot. Uh, in our political culture, we have language of faith that we're often used to get power. That's what we're after. Or, or, or any other thing, that we offer prayer so that we can have a good life. And these all miss the point of what life is all about. Consider with me again these words from the apostle. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. That word loss is repeated over and over. The actual literal translation of the word loss is, could be detriment. <laughs> I consider all these things a detriment. Things that are in my way of really pursuing and knowing Christ. Things I can rely upon or lean back on that really are not really what God is after. A distraction to the real goal of life, knowing Christ. This is hugely important for us because Paul writes these words from prison. He's restrained from doing what he really wants to do, which is to go out and plant churches which is to go out and encourage believers. He couldn't do any of that stuff. But that was not his goal. His goal 
was knowing Christ. And he was able to reach for that goal no matter where he was. That's incredibly good news for us to say that no matter what life is thrown at me, no matter what challenges I have, no matter what restraints are on me, and there are restraints on a lot of us and all of us, that the true goal of spiritual living is to know Christ, is a deep abiding knowledge of Jesus. His physical freedom had been taken from him, and his future is uncertain, but he centers himself in the real goal of life, which was to know Jesus. Friends, in any and every situation, we can always ask God, what do you want me to know of you here? Whether it's in grief, whether it's in loss, whether it's in success, um, what, what do you want me to know? And I think the second thing that we see, not only is it the value and the priority of his life, but the second way that we position ourselves to know Jesus is to reject self-righteousness. Listen to what he says. He says in verse 9, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Paul was on guard against what he refers to as a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. He had a very religious background, as we've already heard. He was a Pharisee. He used to be part of the moral police of the culture. He was considered to be a gatekeeper of the Jewish religion. You know, he would have been on CNN and Fox News talking of religion in very derogatory terms against everyone else that we often see. This is Paul. Um, He understood his propensity for religious snobbery and propaganda. He knew that about himself. He's very self-aware. But he also knew, and he himself wrote it in Romans 9 about the nature of humankind. Listen to what he says in Romans chapter 3. He says, what shall we conclude? Do we have an advantage? Not at all. For we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are under the power of sin. As it is written, there's no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away and have together become worthless. There's no one who does good. Not even one. The throats, their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceits. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. There's no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know, he says, that whatever the law says, it says to those under the law so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. Paul quotes a litany of Old Testament passages revealing the truth about humankind that we do not have enough to make us righteous, not even in our attempts, and it is always manifested deep within us about the things that come out of our mouths, about people, about God, about life. Self-righteousness, friends makes a mockery of the cross of Christ. It makes the argument that other people need Jesus a little bit more or maybe a lot more than I do. Self-righteousness teaches us to be self-reliant. It leads us to compare ourselves with others, which we always come out just a little bit ahead. It manifests itself in judgmental attitudes toward people. It subtly suggests that we are inherently good and deserving of God's blessings. It robs us of a grateful heart which submits to God's will when it isn't pleasant. Self-righteousness blinds us to growth areas in our lives while highlighting the faults of others. Self-righteousness is the enemy of knowing Jesus better because it focuses on our ability and our effort to do good rather than God's graciousness and mercy toward us and others. If we don't think that self-righteousness is a problem for us to deal with, it automatically convicts us of being self-righteous. Paul was cognizantly aware of the human condition in himself, which caused him to reject the notion that he was good enough or could do good enough to obtain or earn God's favor. He rejected that altogether. We have a tendency toward self-righteousness, and Jesus himself addresses that. In Matthew chapter 16, it says, When they went across the lake... The disciples forgot to take bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. 
And in verse 12, then they understood he was not telling them to be on guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Jesus understood the human temptation to believe that we can be good enough to gain God's approval. This is the nature of religion. It leads us into a trap. Try harder. Do better. Do more. This kind of religion hypes the human will as the main motivator for good and somehow tries to convince us that all that we read about in the papers of others we would never in our wildest imaginations consider for ourselves. What God does is unmask all that and says, if you're so deluded to think that you could never do bad and evil as much as it's portrayed, you have missed the element of your human condition robs Christ of the glory of what his cross did for us. Paul wanted to stay rooted in the truth that righteousness is a gift from God by faith, and we receive this wonderful gift whereby it's God who makes us right. It's God who puts us in the right. It's Christ's death and and sacrifice that cleanses us from any and all of our sin, past, present, and future. And when we get moved away from the reality of the human condition, we forget that. And it robs us of the ability to know Jesus better. A third thing that we see here is not only should it be the highest priority, knowing Christ, not only should we reject self-righteousness, but we have got to learn to embrace suffering with resurrection. Listen again to what he says in verse 10 and 11. He says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Notice how Paul combines the power of resurrection with participation in suffering. It's these twin truths that provide a context for us to really know Jesus. If self-righteousness is our enemy, friends, suffering is our friend to knowing Jesus. Now, let me be clear. Suffering is not something we seek for. It's not something that should be pursued at all. In fact, you don't have to go out and look for suffering. It comes to you. It knocks on your door. Not only does it knock on your door, it barges in and announces itself. You don't have to go out and look for suffering. The question is not whether you will suffer or not. You will, and some more than others. The real question is whether we can embrace suffering as an opportunity to know Jesus better. Think about it. We don't really come to know God until and unless we suffer. If things always go right for us, from the moment of our birth to our dying breath, what would we know of God? Maybe that God is a provider, but that implies that we had a need that needed to be provided for, which is in itself a form of suffering. No, it's only in our suffering that we're able to actually come to know Jesus. And why is that? Because he consoles us because he knows what it's like to suffer. That's where the intimate knowledge of Jesus comes from in our posture of suffering because he knows what it's like to struggle, suffer. This becomes the mystery of what we just celebrated this wonderful incarnation. Listen to how the writer of Hebrews casts it. He says, for this reason he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people, because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. This is the beauty of the Advent season and the Christmas celebration that we've come off of. You ever wonder why God didn't just fully beam a human fully grown Jesus down for just a moment of death and then resurrection? He came as we all come. He lived the life we live in obscurity without any special favors. So when we go through suffering, it's a pathway to experience his watch care and his faithfulness and his friendship. Friends, I've known Christ for 30 plus years. I've known him and the power of his ability to deliver me from addiction. I know in the ability of God to answer prayer. But you know where I've come to the most intimate knowledge of God, and that's when I dealt as a 23-year-old young man with a broken body where I fell and I couldn't even feed myself. And it was in those moments where I found the consolation of Jesus who knows what it's like to suffer and came to me with intimate knowledge. I wouldn't wish it on anyone, 
but I'm incredibly grateful for my accident years ago, and I wouldn't change it if I could do it over again. Listen to what Jesus says. For you have granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to those who have given, you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's what Jesus says. This is eternal life. Not you getting to go to heaven when you die. Eternal life begins in the moment in which you say yes to Jesus for his life feeds you regularly and consistently and it's through his intimate knowledge. Resurrection becomes the main reason why suffering is our friend because resurrection teaches us that the worst thing to happen to us is not the last thing that will happen to us. And it's because Jesus was raised from the grave after he suffered, it's that we can embrace suffering as a way to know him better, knowing that this will not be the end of us. That's good news for us. That's why suffering is our friend. Finally, we commit to a lifelong journey of knowing Jesus better. Listen again to what he says in verse 12. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Notice the humility of Paul. I've not obtained all this. I've, I haven't arrived at my goal. He's an older guy. He's writing. He's been through a lot of suffering. He's had profound encounters. He's had incredible revelations. He writes about them all, and he's telling them, I've got a lot of room to grow in my knowledge of Jesus. And so I'm after this. And he uses the phrase, press on, to take hold. Pride tells us that we have got God all figured out that we know all that there is to know about God. Listen to what Paul says to the Romans again. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who's known the mind of the Lord who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? From him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. There's no end to our knowing of God all into eternity, we will discover the amazing qualities. And the reason is, is because Jesus is so fascinating. He is so fascinating. Paul uses a key phrase twice to explain his pursuit. He says, press on. I press on. You know what it means to press on? It means to run swiftly in the face of obstacles and resistance. It's a word of perseverance, a word that allows you not to let anything knock you off the trail or the track. You are running sometimes against the wind in pursuit of your goal. One thing I do, he says. I love that. This is the one thing that I do. It's a word of focus. Priorities are the things which every other thing revolves around and makes room for. That's a priority. Priority is a choice that we make and making a commitment and keeping it out of which all of the other aspects of life revolve around. It's the non-negotiable of life. He says, here's the secret. Here's the secret. I forget what is behind, and I strain toward what is ahead. To forget what is behind, all the success, all the failures, all the struggles, I do not necessarily wipe them from my memory. I just don't focus on them as either some strange form of consolation or some hindrance, but I strain. Straining is a beautiful word because straining means that you are stretching forth all that of who you are to get there. It gives the impression of a runner who's running toward his goal and his chest is out in front of everything so he can get the first part of him there. It's the full force of our life heading in this direction. So the question before us today as we are committed followers of Jesus is, how am I pressing on to know Jesus better? This is not anything passive. It's not anything that just casually happens. I press on when I commit myself to the pursuit of God. That's why it's around this time of the year where we commit ourselves to reading through Scripture or parts of Scripture. We pursue God individually, but that always has its limits. Anything that we can do in and of ourselves has its limits, and the reason it has its limits is because we hold ourselves accountable, which we have a difficult degree in doing. 
But God gives us the beautiful gift of community so that we can pursue knowing Jesus in the context of community. That's why we do things like life groups or the new book study that we're doing or the Sunday night encounter or the Friday morning man up or other forms of small accountability groups so that we can say our desire to know Christ is borne out by the commitments that we make to pursue God together. That's what we mean by I want to know Christ. I'm going to suffer, but I want to participate in that with others who can share with me and lift me up and remind me of the truth of who God is and what God has said. So these are the resolutions. And the first one is to know Jesus better. Would you pray with me? Holy God, we give you thanks that you have chosen to reveal yourself to us in Jesus. And we ask you in these holy moments of response where we confess and receive grace, where we're drawn to this altar, We pray, O God, that you would move in our hearts to have that singular focus like Paul, that we would say, I want to know Christ and back it up by the commitments that we need to make to move in that truth. We ask all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.